we were to summarize the main plot of Philip K. Dick's novel, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and also the Blade Runner, the film adaptation of it, it would be along these lines. Rick Deckard, bounty hunter, has to chase down six androids masking themselves as human beings who will try to kill him as he tries to kill them. So what's going on here? Deckard is a bounty hunter. He gets paid. His entire job is hunting down Andes or androids who are becoming more and more sophisticated in passing themselves off as humans. They're not supposed to be on Earth, but they come back to Earth in part because they want to get away from their bad lives out in the colonies where they are at best, you know, very valued tools and at worst slave labor. So our story begins with Deckard getting to step into the job as senior bounty hunter because the, the previous senior bounty hunter, Dave Holden, uh, was able to retire two of the eight escaped androids and then was not quite done in, but certainly taken out of commission by the third one. So we begin here in chapter three, learning about these. <clears throat> As Deckard unlocks his office door, his superior police inspector, Harry Bryant, um, says, meet me at 930 in Dave Holden's office. And, and then he tells him Holden is in Mount Zion Hospital with a laser track through his spine. He'll be there for a month at, at least until they can get a hold of one of those new organic plastic spinal sections to take hold. And Rick says, well, what happened? Uh, the department's chief bounty hunter had been all right yesterday. At the end of the day, he'd zipped off in his hover car to his apartment. Bryant muttered something over his shoulder, and then he hears his secretary, Ann Marston, say, Mr. Deckard, you know what happened to Mr. Holden? He got shot. He says, yeah. It must have been one of those new, ever extra clever Andes the Rosen Association is turning out. And so this is setting the, the framework for what's going on. New, more challenging androids that have to be dealt with. A little bit later, uh, Bryant is saying, to Deckard, this is the first time you'll be acting as senior bounty hunter. Dave knows a lot. He's got years of experience behind him. And then Rick says, well, so do I. And then Bryant clarifies, you've handled assignments devolving to you from Dave's schedule. He's always decided exactly which ones to turn over to you and which not to. But now you've got six he intended to retire himself, one of which managed to get him first. This one, Max Polikoff, that's what it calls itself anyhow. Assuming Dave was right, everything is based on that assumption, this entire list. And yet the Voigtkampf altered scale has only been administered to the first three. The two, Dave retired, and then Polikoff, it was while Dave was administering the test, that's when Polikoff lasered him. And Rick says, well, okay, well, that proves that he was right. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been lasered. Polikoff would have no motive. And then... Deckard is going to be sent off to the Rosen Association to try out the test, ultimately on Rachel Rosen. And then he'll come back and start taking up this assignment, retire six androids. And he decides to begin with Polikoff, who is the one who uh, nearly killed his colleague and um, who's probably been alerted to what's going on. So he's like, well, this is the one we, we probably need to deal with uh, the first. And so he goes to uh, Polikoff's work, the Bay Area Scavengers Company. And, and why is Polikoff there? He's pretending to be what's called an ant head, one of the worst off of the specials, deteriorated mentally. As it turns out, Polikoff might be one of the sharpest of the bunch. And um, Deckard goes to his work. He's not there. He hasn't been there. Um, you know, he's, he presents his ID. Where's your employee at his job or at home? And uh, the person says, Polikoff ought to be at work flattening hover cars at our daily city plant, dumping them into the bay. However, he's not then, uh, he said, terminating the call. Polikoff didn't show up to work today, no explanation. So Deckard goes to his apartment and lands 
on the roof. He says, what a grimy place. By elevator, he descends to Polikoff's floor, found the hall unlit like a subterranean cave. Using his police A-powered sealed beam light, he illuminated the hall, once again glanced over the onion skin carbon, the, trans, the, the duplicate, right? The voight Kampf test had been administered. That part could be bypassed. And so he sets up a wave transmitter, uh, you know, somewhat like the mood organ, except on a larger scale, and punches a key for catalepsy, making everybody else in the building frozen stiff. Everyone, human and Andy alike in the vicinity, no risk to me. All I have to do is walk in and laser him. So he goes in and no Polikoff there either, right? Only semi-ruined furniture, a place of kipple and decay. So he goes up to the roof, and um, he uh, uh, is now going to move on to the next one, uh, Luba Luft, but there's uh, somebody who's supposed to be coming in from the Soviet uh, police agency, and um, they're you know, waiting for, for him, and he shows up. So here we go. Mr. Deckart, uh, uh, he approaches, asking with a Slavic accent, the bounty hunter for the San Francisco Police Department. The ex empty taxi rose. The Russian watched it go. I'm Sander Kadali, the man said, and opened the car door to squeeze in beside Rick. And Rick figures out that this isn't Sander Kadali. There actually isn't a police officer coming from the uh, Soviet Union and, the, and their police. Um, he says to him, and he's got sort of a slip of the tongue, you're not Polakoff, you're Kadali. And then the android says to him, don't you mean the, the other way around? You're a bit confused. I mean, you're Polakoff, the android, you're not from the Soviet police. And Rick presses the emergency button on the floor of his car, which means that the laser tube won't fire. And uh, he starts to go after him physically. I'll have to break your pencil neck. And he grabs both hands for Rick's throat. As the android's hand sunk, sank into his throat, Rick fired his regulation issue old style pistol from its shoulder holder. The slug struck the android in the head and its brain box burst. The Nexus 6 unit, which operated it, blew into pieces a raging mad wind which carried throughout the car. Bits of it, like the radioactive dust itself, whirled down on Rick, the retired remains of the android rock back collided with the car door, bounced off and struck heavily against him. He found himself struggling to shove the twitching remnants of the android away. <clears throat> so then he calls in and says, I've got the first one. I've got Polikoff. Now, Polikoff is an interesting uh, person. So he's posing both as um, a special and as this guy Sandor Kadali. And a little bit later, we get a take on Polikoff that could be true or could just be uh, there to lead us off the trail. And it's uh, when he's in, in the, the fake police station talking with um, Garland, who is the next one on his, his uh, thing. And so he, um, he says, uh, this is Garland talking about Polikoff. You know where I guessed wrong? I didn't know about Polikoff. He must have come here earlier. Obviously, he came here earlier. In another group entirely, no contact with ours. He was already entrenched in the WPO when I arrived. I took a chance on the lab report, which I shouldn't. Polikoff was almost my finish, too, Rick says. And then he says, yeah, there was something about him. I don't think <clears throat> he could have been the same brain unit type as we. He must have been souped up or tinkered with, an altered structure, unfamiliar even to us, a good one too, almost good enough. So there's something unusual, at least from the android's perspective, to this particular android, Polikov. We move on to the next one, Garland. Garland is listed on uh, Rick's uh, things that he's gotten from Dave Holden, the, the sheets, as being an insurance underwriter, but he's actually a police inspector in the fake uh, Mission Street Police Department that is infested, as, as Rick says, with androids. And so now he's uh, posing in that way, and he's got androids working for him, the Harness Bull, for example, who Rick isn't going to do anything with because he's not on his list. 
even though he is an android who's not supposed to be there. Um, and he's suggesting to his own um, colleague, his own subordinate, uh, that he's an android uh, once, once they, they uh, start revealing these things. And he actually suggested to Deckard that Phil Resch is going to be really, really upset. Phil Resch, of course, turns out not to be an android and actually to be a rather unusual bounty hunter. So Rick is going to also do in Garland, and Garland reveals a bit more information to him. All of this is happening uh, with the Garland stuff as a result of going after Luba Luft. Luba Luft is another escaped android who is posing as an opera singer and who is good enough to be singing opera. She has a genuine flair for it. And, you know, Rick even feels kind of bad about all of this. You know, the, she, he's watching uh, a rehearsal and um, he's, he's, you know, sort of mulling things over and, and uh, he actually realizes that he's part of the form destroying process of entropy. The Rosen Association creates an ion make and he um, studies uh, Luba Luft, right? Reading the, the sheet of information. A little ironic, the sentiment her role calls for. However, vital, active, and nice looking. An escaped android could hardly tell the truth about itself anyhow. On the stage, Luba Luft sang, and he found himself surprised at the quality of her voice. It rated with that of the best, even of the notables in his collection of historic tapes. The Rosen Association had built her well, he had to admit. And again, he perceived himself sub specie eternitatis, or the Spinozian phrase, the form destroyer called forth by what he heard and saw here. Perhaps the better she functions, the better a singer she is, the more I'm needed. If the androids had remained, remained substandard, like the ancient Q40s made by Duran Associates, there'd be no problem and no need of my skill. And then he begins doing the Voigt Kampf test with her, and she finds ways to subvert it. Uh, holds a, a laser tube on him, calls the police. That gets him to Garland Station, where eventually Garland and Phil Resch will shoot it out. And uh, so Deckard isn't actually killing Garland. It's, it's Phil Resch who kills him. And we can say the same thing about Luba Luft, because Phil Resch, not quite sure if he's an android or not, uh, quite worried about it, goes with Deckard to uh, go after Luba Luft and... Um, Phil Resch, antagonized by Luba Luft, suggesting that he's an android himself, lasers her in the elevator. And there's a lot of back and forth there about the empathy that uh, Deckard begins feeling for Luba Luft and for androids more generally. So those are the three. Of those three, uh, only one is killed by Deckard, but he gets to collect all three bounties. Then there's the other three, Pris Stratton, um, who we encounter very early on uh, in, in connected with Isidore. She uh, moves into his building. And actually what she tells him is in Chapter 6, originally he asks, um, uh, you know, uh, he says, did you get my name, John Isidore? And she says, yeah, you work for Hannibal Sloat, who I'm sure doesn't exist outside of your imagination. My name is, she gave him one last warmthless glance as she returned to her apartment, hesitated and said, I'm Rachel Rosen. Now, Rachel Rosen is another android who plays a major role within this work, right? And Pris is not Rachel, but Pris is made along the same lines as Rachel, as we learn later on. So Isidore says, of the Rosen Association, the system's largest manufacturer of humanoid robots used in our colonization program. And then a complicated expression instantly crossed her face, fleetingly gone at once. No, I never heard of them. I don't know anything about it. More of your chicken head imagination, I suppose. John Isidore and his personal private empathy box. Poor Mr. Isidore. But your name suggests, and then she says, my name is Pris Stratton. That's my married name. I always use it. I never use any other name than Pris. You can call me Pris. No, you better address me as Miss Stratton because we don't really 
know each other. So that's her, and she holds up with Isidore and gets the word out to the two other remaining androids, Irmgard and Roy Beatty. And we find that um, they, you know, come to the apartment. And in chapter 14, Roy says, can we talk? Indicating Isidore. Pris, vibrant with bliss, said, it's okay up to a point. To Isidore, she said, excuse us. She led the babies on off to one side and muttered at them. The three of them returned to confront Mr. Isidore, who felt uncomfortable and out of place. And they begin talking And he's going to realize that they're androids after a a short amount of time. Um, Then they're they're asking or they're talking with each other about um, their their android uh, companions, you could call them. So Roy Beatty says they got Polakoff. The joy which had appeared on Pris's face at seeing her friends melted away. Who else? They got Garland, Roy Beatty said. They got Anders and Gitchell. And then just a little earlier today, they got Luba. So Anders and Gitchell were retired by Dave Holden. The other three by either Deckard or Deckard and Phil Rush. Um, I didn't think they'd get Luba. Remember, I kept saying that during the trip. So that leaves, Pris says, the three of us, Irmgard said with apprehensive urgency. That's why we're here. Roy Beatty's voice boomed out with unexpected warmth. Um, and then they go on. They had this investigator, this bounty hunter, Irmgard said in agitation, named Dave Holden. And Polakoff almost got him. Almost got him, Roy echoed his smile, now immense. So he's in this hospital, this Holden. And evidently they gave his list to another bounty hunter. And Polakoff almost got him too. But it wound up with him retiring Polakoff. Then he went after Luba. We know that because she managed to get hold of Garland and he sent out someone to capture the bounty hunter and take him to the Mission Street building. Luba called us after Garland's agent picked up the bounty hunter. She was sure it would be okay. She was sure Garland would kill him. But evidently, something went wrong on mission. We don't know what. Perhaps we never will. Then Pris asks, does this bounty hunter have our names? Oh, yes, dear, I suppose he does, Irmgard said, but he doesn't know where we are. Roy and I aren't going back to our apartment. We have as much stuff in our car as we can cram in, and we have decided to take one of these abandoned apartments in this ratty old building. So that is them establishing themselves, bringing each other up to speed, and they're going to stick together as a strategy. They think that it was probably too risky to be out there trying to pass in society as the other androids were going to do. There is one other thing to bring up, which is that Roy Beatty himself is somewhat of a false messiah type. We get in the um, information sheet, Roy Beatty has an aggressive, assertive air of Erzat's authority. Given to mystical preoccupations, this android proposed the group escape attempt underwriting it ideologically with a pretentious fiction as to the sacredness of so-called android life. In addition, this android stole and experimented with various mind-fusing drugs, claiming when caught that it hoped to promote in androids a group experience similar to that of mercerism, which it pointed out remains unavailable to androids. And Rick Deckard is reflecting on this, uh, this pharmacist who Roy Beatty was, right? And the account had a pathetic quality, a rough, cold android hoping to undergo an experience from which, due to a deliberately built-in defect, it remained excluded. He could not work up much concern for Roy Beatty. He caught from Dave's jottings a repellent quality hanging about this particular android. Beatty had tried to force the fusion experience into existence for itself, and when that fell through, it had engineered the killing of a variety of human beings, followed by the flight to Earth. Now, there's another take on Beatty, which is that he's, you know, he's the real deal, and we're going to see this with Rachel Rosen after she seduces or allows herself to be seduced because clearly Deckard has a desire for her. They have sex and then she says, you're not going to be able to keep hunting androids, but that's okay. You know why? Because this trip we're taking won't be wasted. You're going to meet a wonderful spiritual man. Roy Beatty, he said, do you know all of them? 
I knew all of them when they still existed. I know three now. We tried to stop you this morning before you started out with Dave Holden's list. I tried again just before Polikoff reached you. But then after that, I had to wait. And she goes on and says, Luba Luft and I had been close, very close friends for almost two years. What did you think of her? Did you like her? I liked her, but you killed her. Phil Resch killed her. Oh, okay. Now, now we know that. And so Rachel is revealing that she not only knows these androids, but she thinks that Roy Beatty was, in fact, you know, a, a great man, a great person. And all three of these, these final ones, Pris Stratton, who's the most difficult one because she looks like Rachel, for whom Deckard has very conflicted feelings. Um, he's able to kill her. Mercer actually helps out with that. And then he shoots Irmgard, and then he shoots Roy Beatty. We don't have anything like what happens in the Blade Runner movie. Instead, it's actually much more methodical and one-sided. And this winds up becoming a record carried out by this newly promoted chief bounty hunter, right? Uh, Deckard, who gets to step into the role of Dave Holden after Dave Holden uh, fails and is, is lasered by Max Polikoff. He does in all of these six androids, and it produces a massive uh, reflection change, uh, a metanoia, uh, you know, a turning of the soul within him. And he probably won't be able to continue after this. But that brings the plot essentially to a close, at least as far as the hunting the killers, hunting the hunters, hunting the androids goes.